So anyway, here is the website that's got some photos in there. We'll link to Mill River. We'll improve all this and make it better and more user friendly. There's little quick, uh, you know, quirks about all this stuff. There's Pediobius fovulatus. Yeah. So anyway, uh, we have most of the main pests on here. We're going to need to put some of the newer ones in, like kudzu bug and uh, some of the other ones. So here, for example, harlequin bug. One of the things to um, go here and click on this. Oops, that's all right. Okay, this you notice what I got there is the 1952 USDA yearbook. The other thing I tell you guys is go to yard sales and flea markets and look for these old golden guides and these old Simon and Schuster things. Let's see if this one will load up. Okay, well there's something wrong with it. Um, well, let's see. Then go to this one. So here we are looking at harlequin bugs. Let's see if this. Okay. See how you can tell that, the, that that plant has been stunted by harlequin bugs. So if I'm scouting, man, I can tell you right now that plant needs to be nuked <laughs> by soap. You know what I mean? That's the only control that I know to get rid of harlequin bugs. Now, they, it does have egg parasitoids. Harlequin bug has three different kinds of egg parasitoids. But I'm going to kill everything. You guys can see the fetish that I have for harlequin bugs. Is I am not going to let those guys get past me. So, you have no. To, you have to hit those guys hard yeah. and fast right. and early and right. keep hitting them. And, and then eventually, they'll just like come to a plateau. Right. It doesn't mean you can relax because a little down the road, they'll start to build again. Right. And you can breathe a few times during the summer. But when you see them starting, you can't let them get past that gregarious stage. No, uh uh. Together before they spread out. Because if they spread out, you'll run out of time. And the other thing I'll tell you is you can use your farmscaping to prevent them. Because if they get into farmscaping and you nuke them in there, then they don't go in. Well, the first time I did it, I let them get in there thinking that they would stay in there, and good grief, they multiplied, and we and had a horrendous. That's what started me. You know, I would never stop squishing. Sessions of Cleomys, so you can wipe out the, the ones where they're heavy. Right. Um, yep. Oh yes, right. That's a good trap crop. Cleom, spiderwort is a really good trap crop. What we would do in, at the Highland Lake is Pat had these tubs of, of soap right at the base of the Cleom plant. All you do is have to come up, hit it a few times, all the harlequin bugs would fall down in the soap, move on to the next plant. And they attract it, yes. Do you have, on this website, like under pets, do you have trap crops listed? Is um, I'm working on, yeah, I have some trap crops for some stuff. That's one of the next things. In fact, if you go to, let me think about this. Uh, that would be awesome. Yeah, well, okay, and that's, also yes. And organic, uh, controls, like right, yeah, yes, right, right. Well, and, and part of that, though, too, you guys, is remember this. If there's a plant that you're growing and there's a closely related species to it, grow that as a trap. I mean, that's what I, we ended up doing. Yeah, I mean, what, what, what And what happened with me too is I started hanging out with these California folks and the California folks were the ones telling me about these trap, you know what I mean, I'm like, thank you very much, Mr. Dr. Right. Bug. For um, cucumber, it's the buffalo corn. Yes, which right. Which the highest amount of bitter. So you want, you know, for the whole family, it would be the buffalo corn. Mm -hmm. Pardon? I mean, for the whole cucurbit table. Yes, it would work. That's going to be the trap crop. Yeah. And you know what's funny is in our valley, you know, the edges of the roads have that old buffalo squash, and I'll bet the Indians grew that stuff. Mm -hmm. I bet a lot of that is just remnant, because some of the areas where we were were really heavily cultivated. I mean, there's kivas and all this stuff that you can see where Cove Creek and Watauga River come together just down from my house. So I hope that we've been able to poke a few holes in the blinders that you guys might have on farmscaping. The thing to do is don't be afraid. Poke the box. Try some stuff. Don't be afraid to fail. Uh, you know, for every, for every insight that I have found, I've tried a hundred things that didn't work, but I just kept going. I've, you know, like Pat says, swim upstream. That's the way to go. Or my dad would say, if the road isn't uphill, you're on, not on the right road. Right? So I'll close if there's any other statements that you guys or anything. I, I'll tell you what, I will do that trap crop thing. That's a really good one because um, that would be really easy to do. 
And that's one of the reasons why we would use that BB-50 is because it had leaf mustard in it and it had radishes. And, and the thing that bugs, plant feeding bugs, the thing that, Gesundheit, the thing that plant feeding bugs like the most are green seed pods. So I use red bud as a trap crop for stink bugs. Because red buds get these big pods on them and I can spray them and nuke all of my stink bugs. Anything that has a green pod. Cleon has a big green pod full of seeds. Radishes, big green pod full of seeds. If you have big green pods full of seeds out there, I guarantee you your plant feeding stink bugs, phytophagous stink bugs is what they're, you'd call them, will go there. Meanwhile, while your radish is in flower, it's a spectacular beneficial insect nectar. Yes, right. So you get double, and then actually, you can also have some of those radishes that you grow for pods and use the pods in your CSA or for, for markets because there's a particular one that's specific to that, the rat tail, which is probably the worst name I've ever heard for a vegetable. <laughs> rat tail radish is grown for the pods. So you've gone past the stage of having fed your beneficial you know, some of those are going to be covered up with pests, but there's going to be plenty of good ones that you can actually sell. And that's the other thing we have to get to is the, to cover the multiplicity of ways that each farmscape and plant fits into what you're doing. Right. It's, it's, very, it's very rare. I mean, cup plant, even cup plant, you've got cut flower and you have beneficial insect flower, plus you have the water. Um, so it's very rare that a farmscape scaping plant functions as one thing. And they all tend to have many, many. Well, in our system, we try to deliberately pick stuff that has multiple functions, if we can. Not always, but you, know, you think a lot, of the, a lot of the stuff that we're using, once I get back to fennel again, it may, it's a great pickling spice, right? So I've got my garlic in my, my garden. I've got cucumbers. I've got several different kinds of pickling spices that I just go out and pick. I, have, I use grape leaves in my pickles. But I got everything I got except the pickling spice that I, you know, the, that you have to buy. I got out of my garden and it was farmscaping. And the seeds from fennel are great. Um, they have vitamin D and respiratory. Yeah, they're breath freshener. Great for gas too. They're yes, they're that's right. Many uses, and that's just one plant. The examples are over and over again. You'll see all the different ways that each plant fits into what you're doing. And the best thing that we can do, and the reason that you see that there's two of us talking here, is this is all about teamwork. It takes, it takes people to figure stuff out, you know, but we have, we, once we share it, you know, I go to meetings like this and I learn from you guys all the time. I've learned several things here today. So that is where we just have to meet regularly. I've gotten really sidetracked into this hemlock stuff, but it was to prove a point. And the point is, I don't care what system, if you use these farmscaping principles right, you can control pests in almost any system. And so it doesn't matter I, you know, I'm growing broccoli. You're out of the field in four months. Hemlock lives to be 1,200 years old. Here's your R-selected plant that's over really fast. Here's your K-selected plant that's going to live for 1,000 years if you let it. The principles are the same. Well, thank you, Chris. What I say, thank you all. Ryan Morris was working on the uh, Virginia, Virginia Tech project no to. one time and said, Pat, you know, the problem is I go out because his special area of expertise is low-till and cover crops. He said, the problem is, Pat, I go out to talk about the low-till cover crops. All they want to hear about is the farm scheme. Right. That's all they care about. I said, Ryan, it's because they get it. The world works and they love it. And it really is. People are fascinated because it's just like, oh, it all does make sense. It all fits. And Ron said something else that was real interesting. Once he, you know, it took, it didn't take him too long to get up with me and Pat. We started sitting around and all of a sudden it was like, whoa, okay. Ron said something that was real interesting because what we ended up doing, the final product that we ended up doing in broccoli was we were doing no-till broccoli. You know, with these big mulches, we're averaging more than two pounds of broccoli per plant because we'd get a head that weighed 500 grams, or actually we had to pick them smaller. The market's coming to us going, your broccoli heads are too big. I'm going, that's a good problem, okay. And then we use varieties like Pac-Man, or I don't know if Pac-Man's available now, but we wanted varieties that would shoot up side shoots. Our side shoots would weigh 140 grams. If you put three of them together, they were bigger than a California broccoli. So I drive down here in the rain 
29 cases of broccoli to show the Earth Fair people, Bobby Sullivan, and I can't think of the Italian guy's name. I'm two blocks from the warehouse. It's down, remember it used to be down here somewhere on the other side of the road? And one of my belts in my truck goes out. So I pull over, it's in the rain. I see it's my air conditioning belt. Just cut that thing, drive down the road like another half a mile, make it there. What we do is we put all of our broccoli on a pallet and shrink wrap it real quick. And then the CEO, can't think of his name, some Italian guy comes out and he's like, okay, open up these boxes. So you open up a couple boxes and he looks, he looks at both of them. He goes, whose is this? It's ours. He goes, you guys got a contract. Boom, man, it used to be the greatest. I would drive down to uh, Whole Foods or Wellspring down here, whatever it was called in the East Gate, and I'd drop off. I could put 780 pounds of broccoli in my Mazda truck, three deep with silver tarp, and then just ice that thing up as heavy as I could and head here as fast as I could. So what did Ron Morris also say? Oh, yeah, sorry. This is, I'm getting at the end. Moments are hard to forget. It is. <laughs> thank you, thank you, yes, and, 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 and remind, okay. So what Ron said was farmscaping and no-till are not additive. Two and two is not four. Farmscaping and no-till are exponential. When you put those two things together, there's a synergy there that happens that we have lost the ability to recognize. And so coming from him, Mr. No-Till, he, this is the guy that was doing no-till in the 70s. Yeah, he's roller crimping, and yeah, we were using suit. Well, we used several different things. We used Sudex with uh, Vetch, Harry Vetch. Um, you know what I mean? We used uh, Millet. I mean, we we tried all these different things. All of them would work great. You know, if we could get them, if you can get them in and get that plant established, that was the hardest thing: is to get that stuff in there. What was the best combination? The best comment, the the most the most biomass that we got was sun hemp. And I'm trying to think what the companion plant that we had in there, that stuff uh, got. It could have been probably a Sudex. It, it could have been Sudex. Yeah, you, yeah, it was Sudex because we went in and I actually cut the Sudex uh, heads out. Yeah, because I didn't want those in there. And we would roll, that stuff was four tons an acre biomass. Before broccoli, I mean, pretty much we went more nitrogen or something. have incredible nitrogen. Oh, it's, See, it's. What Ron does is he grows rows of legumes and then you walk area Right. right. We had so many out there with the yellow flower, pea flower that we were next to that didn't look at. It's, I have some pictures of we it on the web. It's incredible. We sickle. We would sickle bar cut it. The nodules on that sun hemp are clumps. They're not single nodules. You would, clumps. Crimping, you would just sickle bar and lay it down. I'd sickle bar and lay it down, and then we had a coulter. We had a coulter, and we could just split that thing and then come in with our. Well, Ron had this special rig that would plant in no till. But I'm pretty sure there's stuff around here now. He had a coulter that would split it, just drop the plant in, cover it back up. I mean, we might shoot it with a little fish, oil, fish emulsion back then. Because he has to rip a, a strip, too, if you're planting. This is basically what that'd be for August production. You gotta right. You've got to rip a strip, too, because if that sudex doesn't die. Right. It's going to keep growing. Yep. It's going to be killed by frost. So you've got your broccoli going ahead so it can compete with that sudex as it's coming up. Yep. And then the frost comes in and lets it releases it, and you get, you get it finished. You know? The other thing that Ron said that was fun was when he was talking about how he tried to talk about um, about farmscape, which he's quite quite able to do, so he had to go where people wanted him to. He, earlier on in our discussion, when we were getting the formulas, I said, this is not this is not a formula thing. You can't get some reduction of time. You have to really pay attention to the dynamics. And he just turned to me one time and said, Pat, you're right. They just want formulas, and this is a reduction. Right. You got it. You cannot boil it down for them. Right. And I say that, but I also want to didn't get all of our of our expression and our um, our taste and our um, respect. We didn't get much of our respect for Brinkley at all because we were using some examples of Brinkley saying this and that because there's so much into the science of it. Brinkley has done probably some of the most spectacular farmscape. Oh farms. man, just unbelievable. So he put Pat and I to shame. Um, yeah, he would he tease. He bought the BB50 and teased all the seeds out, right. and then put them in a planter and would say, you know, he'd call us on like. He'd go, how'd you put it out? I go, well, I shake the bag up and go out and go. Right. And he's like, oh, I'm not even talking to you anymore. Right, yeah. he, he, he just got all kinds of stuff and taught us fun. You know? So it takes that. We want the people who want to quantify to 
But then you don't, I mean, Crying Tell Kenny Haynes has got to, like, you know, count out how many of these plants he's going to put out in his farm scape. He's not going to do it. No. You know? So you've got to, you both have the science to quantify, and then you learn how to, you know, what that is, and then you just, you get good through it after a while. You look at it and go, that's a good mix. You know? I got what I need. And meanwhile, that scientist has got it all counted out, and he can tell you, yes, that works because of this, and that's, we want both. And Brinkley is doing the scientist part wonderfully. I don't mean that, you know. Oh, yeah. yeah He's a little prejudiced to get weed, against weeds. It's okay. Yeah. I'll let my weeds grow without him. Without him. Well, thank you guys. I hope, you know, let this be the beginning of something that we, you know, Pat and I have been around here for 22 years. Sometimes a little hard to get up with us, but, you know, that's okay. But we're here to help. Here's, here's this website. A lot of, you know, what I'd say is most of the stuff we, we saw today is on this. So if you just go through and look at these pictures, we're going to get better with this, take better macro photos, put, uh, I had a great movie of this, uh, parasitic wasp stinging a looper and straightening it out and putting it under its mouth and flying off with it. I sent it to him. You know, we were geeking out. This was insect porn for us. I'm like, oh, you should see this thing, Pat. It does this pneumatic pumping of the thorax before it flies off. You know? See, Richard and I can go for like months without talking to each other. And real often what the call is, is you won't believe what I just saw. <laughs> right. That was Pat going, I saw an imported cabbage one flying sideways in the field. It was a dragonfly. I'm like, okay, that's what I need to know. Boom. Thank you guys.